Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Welcome. Good to see Miss Gray here today. Charlie. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glad that they made it today. Look forward to having a good service. For those of you that don't know, Pastor is under the weather this morning, so he's not here. So I'll be doing all the stuff up here except for preaching and then. Brother Darrell's got that in a few minutes. So let's open with a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day and thank you for the privilege we have to be back in your house. Lord, I pray you'll just bless our time together this morning. Lord, be with the songs that are sung. Lord, just help us to listen to the words and apply them to our lives. And Lord, this good music doesn't take the place of the Bible, Lord, but it supplements it. And Lord, good spiritual lyrics can speak to us and can stay with us as we go throughout the week. Pray be with Brother Darrell as he brings the message. Lord, give him a recall of what you've given him this week in study. Be with the pastor, Lord, I pray. Just help him to feel better. Just uh, give him healing that he may be back with us soon. Thank you for loving us and keeping us. In your name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Seventy-seven on Georgia Stormy Banks. Let's stand and sing all four verses, please. Page seven seventy-seven.
on our announcements today. Um, our Teacher of the Week is Brother Daryl Gaines, so pray for him. Our Missionary of the Month is the Josh Wagar family. Um, got some good news Wednesday night. Tony, or Jenny, uh, Andrea had talked to Tony and Jenny and said that the spot had not grown any since the last MRI. So they were going to do it on the little uh, Uriah. So they're going to do another one, I think, the first of the year. And if that one still looks good, they may be able to uh, make plans to get back to Chuke. So continue to pray there. Um, their government official is Mark Robinson, our lieutenant governor. Pray for him. And our local safety organization is Moore Regional Hospital. So remember, remember uh, the staff there as well this week. Uh, on our announcements, uh, Claire, don't forget we have practice today, uh, next Sunday and the 26th. At 4.30, we're getting ready for Christmas, which is, as Pastor starts saying in January, is right around the corner, but it truly is right around the corner now. Um, and speaking of that, if you have any announcements, the Christmas cantata will be Sunday, December the 10th at 11 o'clock uh, that morning, so make plans to attend there. And the other announcement is our Thanksgiving dinner and service is going to be uh, in the Fellowship Hall Tuesday, November 21st at 6.30. Everyone, please bring a cover dish and a drink, and there's a sign-up sheet in the vestibule. It's always one of my favorite services of the year. I look forward to that, so <laughs> hope you'll make plans to attend that as well. Any other announcements? Okay, it's going to be 2024 before we can turn around here. I don't think I have any others. All right, we'll have another choir special. Yeah. 
turn to page 571. Let's stand and sing the first, second, third, and last. Please trust and obey. Page 571. <laughs> See Miss Gray here this morning. Amen. Amen. And Charlie. And Charlie. <laughs> yeah, both of you. Both of you. But you know, it's it's convicting when you know I wake up tired and like I really don't want to go to church. And when I when I see folks that that who who will battle all kinds of health issues to get to church, uh, it makes you really it's really convicting. So thank you for your faithfulness, Miss Gray. Um. Do you remember our college students? I think that's the main ones I had. Does anyone, else, anyone else have one? Yes. I have a couple unspoken. Okay, Haley's unspoken. Brother Randy, Paul goes back to the eye clinic on Thursday. Okay. Is this another shot? No. Yes, I need to pray for Mr. Paul. In the eye clinic. You said Thursday? Yes. Okay. 
you will pray for a cousin of mine from Arizona. He's flying in this week to see my brother Donnie. So pray for travel mercies there. He's coming in on Tuesday. I think heading back on Friday. Yes, sir. Uh, remember, brother, if you would, he's traveling to business he's down in um, Texas right now. He should be coming back about the middle of the week. And can you pray for Stone? He's uh, still going through the, uh, the interview and um, meeting process and his new job. So just uh, I think the next step is when you have to start on the train, you pray, you pray that he would be to go well. Okay. Pray for Brinley as she's traveling and Stone with his job situation and uh, getting started on the new job there. Any others? Of course, Pastor, don't forget him. All right. Um, let's see. Brother Richie, would you mind praying for us, please, sir? Our Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege to uh, come before you with these different prayer requests, Lord. And uh, thank you, uh, Lord, that you're more concerned about them than even we are. And that you have a, you know, you have a perfect plan for each and every situation. And uh, thank you for your love uh, for each and every one of us and for each one that's on the prayer list, Lord. And you have their best well there uh, in your thoughts. And, uh, and we thank you and praise you for that. We thank you that you have all power. You're the great physician and you have uh, the answer to all of our needs. And uh, uh, we just praise you for that fact and that we might just remember that each and every day. And, Lord, uh, a lot of times we give up and we uh, lose hope, but uh, Lord, you're still on the throne and you're still uh, sovereign and you have, uh, once again, all power and control over this uh, world. And Lord, we do lift up our pastor and we ask you might just touch him that he might be renewed and might be back again real soon. Uh, we lift up Brother Darrell in the services today, Lord, that you might just uh, use him uh, your special vessel today to bring uh, your word and uh, what we need to hear and help us to uh, be receptive to the preached word and the, uh, the taught word today, Lord, and that it might uh, just do a special work in each and every heart here today, Lord. Uh, we think of uh, little you, Brian, and Lord, uh, thank you for what you've already done uh, through the doctors and uh, there in that situation. We pray, Lord, that he might it might be your will that he get a good uh, bill of health and that they might, uh, it is your will, Lord, they might return to church and uh, minister to the people there once again. And we think of uh, Sam Holt and his family and there in Cleveland and just be with them in a special way, continue to give the doctors wisdom there, Lord. And once again, it's our will, Lord, that uh, you might just have a full recovery and uh, we know that you would like to be a uh, an evangelist in the future, Lord, and uh, we just uh, we just surrender that to you, and uh, we just pray, Lord, that uh, this might be your will, too, that we might one day uh, be uh, evangelists, speak to people maybe all over the country, and Lord, uh, we've uh, no doubt got a story to tell uh, how you've ministered in his life, and uh, you've been with him all these years, Lord, and uh, we think of Donnie uh, Smith, Lord, and Sherry, his wife, and just be with them in that special situation, Lord, and uh, you can give him comfort and uh, just draw him close to you during this time and just be with the rest of the family, encourage them, and uh, we think of Sue Ben and her uh, pain that she's been going through, continue to minister to her, and, uh, and uh, we think of the college students, and Lord, uh, remember my days in college, Lord, and certainly they need your presence and need your help uh, during these uh, years, Lord. And thank you for what you've already uh, done for them. Uh, we got brought them through uh, even uh, already some years of uh, learning. And uh, continue to have your hand of blessing on them. And we think of uh, Haley and I unspoken prayer request. We pray, Lord, that you might just meet that request and need whatever it might be. We thank our brother Paul and the eye clinic on Thursday. We ask you might be with him and give the doctors and nurses wisdom there. And we just pray that uh, the shot might be a help to him and that uh, his uh, eyesight, if it be your will, might be restored. 
uh, we think of uh, Randy uh, Smith's uh, cousin is flying in from Arizona and uh, to see the family and uh, uh, to see Donnie, your Lord, and just give them uh, uh, flying grace and mercy uh, during this time. And uh, just be with Stone and just interview for a new job. And uh, Suzanne, and uh, uh, once again, uh, Miss Payne, uh, who we already mentioned, and Friend Lee, uh, as she's traveling, uh, just uh, watch over her and uh, uh, during this this time of traveling to and fro across the country and, and just draw her close to you and uh, each and every one of these on the prayer list, Lord, we just ask you might minister to them uh, in a special way, a spiritual, uh, just uh, draw them close to you and provide whatever is needed spiritually in their hearts and in their lives and each and every one of us. Once again, thank you for everyone that's here today. And once again, we just surrender the service to you. Speak through Brother Darrell and uh, speak to our hearts what we stand in need of. And we love you and thank you for great love for us. And all these things we ask in Christ's name and for his sake. Amen. 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 Thank you, Brother. Brother Darrell. <coughs> uh, good morning. Again, I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Yeah. Appreciate the opportunity to fill in for Pastor Bobby. It's uh, a privilege and it's an honor. Um, I won't say too much about him this morning because I talked to him this morning and he was texting me and he uh, said I had a. He appreciated the message. He said it was a good message Wednesday night, except for the part where I threw him under the bus. <laughs> and I was like, where did I throw you under the bus? And he reminded me of what I said. So um, I won't say anything about him. I'll just uh, confess this morning. I was talking with him and, you know, pr pray for him. I mean, I'm serious about this. Pray for him and his patience. He was sharing with me this morning that he's not used to being sick and suffering from something this long. Um, he said, so he felt like the Lord was teaching him patience. And so I told him, I said, well, just always remember, this too shall pass. And then I texted him back and I said, and if it doesn't, you'll be with Jesus. So it's a win-win either way. And he didn't respond back. So, um, not to that, anyway. Um, we're going to be in the book of <clears throat> Nahum this morning. It's um, one of the minor prophets. And again, uh, a minor prophet does not mean that they're less important. It's just mostly talking about the length of the book that they have. Uh, the book of Nahum is only three chapters. Um, the title of the message this morning is A Terrible God. A terrible God. Now, if I tell you something is terrible, what is the first thing that would come to your mind? You know, if we were talking about a new restaurant that had opened, I said, that place is terrible. We would think, okay, it's no good. Don't go there. Um, if I were to say, you know, I watch that TV program, don't watch it, it's terrible. Or I just said, it's terrible. You would think, don't watch it. Uh, don't watch that channel. It's terrible. But the idea here and the, the definition of terrible I want us to think of is terrifying. Terrifying. And it doesn't mean, well, what I want us to understand here is, is our God a terrifying God? Absolutely. If you're on the wrong side. If you're his enemy. We tend to want to look at God in um, a very focused kind of a way. We want to focus on different aspects of God. And I've seen many people that had the wrong attitude of God. I used to work with a man. We would sit and we would talk um, for hours about the Bible uh, on break. And, you know, then after a while it just came up. He goes, uh, I brought up something. He goes, I don't pay any attention to those verses that talk about hell. They're not real. And I said, what do you, what do you mean they're not real? real. He said, well, well, God loves us. The Bible teaches that God is love. I said, right. He goes, well, God loves people too much to send them to hell. Um, you know what? He's absolutely right. God sends no one to hell. They choose it. Um, I cannot stand up here and give you an account of how God deals with with every individual in their life when it comes to knowing their uh, condition as a sinner, 
knowing their need of a Savior and being aware of the Lord Jesus Christ as the only answer to sin and this, um, this world that we live in. I cannot tell you how God does that. But I believe in the scripture that God loves us. I believe in the scripture that says it's not God's will that any should perish. I don't believe anyone will have an excuse. Anyone will have a reason as to why they did not accept Christ as Savior. Now, again, I can't sit up here and give you A, B, and C of how I know that. I can just tell you the scripture and the faith I have in the goodness of God. So as I talk about the goodness of God, and then I go back into the title of the message, it's a terrible God. <clears throat> what we're going to be looking at today, um, this is a historical account by this prophet, Nahum. And um, he was a contemporary of Isaiah, and he's talking here about a historical thing. Well, he's prophesizing a historical thing that actually happened. We know that if God says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But here he's talking to the city of Nineveh. Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. Now, most of us know, well, I say good things about, Assyria, uh, about Nineveh. We know from the book of Jonah that uh, it was a wicked city. It was one of the most wicked places that existed. Uh, Jonah had such a hatred of them that he wanted to disobey God. He did not want them to be saved. He hated these people so badly, he didn't want them to be saved. I'm not going to go off on this tangent, but I dare say there are Christians that are sitting in church pulpits today that are Jonas. They look around in this world and they look at society and there are groups of people that they don't want to get saved. Um, we'll leave that there. I think everyone knows you know, what I'm talking about, but if it's got God's will that any should perish, why should it be ours? Why should we be um, open even to that? That ought to be an affront to us just as much as any other sin is. But basically what had happened is Jonah had gone here to Nineveh, and we know the good news of that story is all the people repented, and they came to serve God. Well, jump ahead about 100 years, and now they are the capital of the Syria, as we said, but now they have gone back so wicked that God says that's it. Um, this doesn't surprise me, because if we know anything from history, we know the cycle that we see throughout history. There will be uh, some sort of a revival. There will be a serving of God, a hatred of sin, um, a love for people, and then that generation dies out. And here comes a new generation. And it's amazing that humanity is still as stupid as we are because every generation is always smarter than the one that came before it in their own mind. We should be mentally and spiritually involved, evolved to the point right now that we should be almost like Enoch, to where we could just walk right in to heaven because we're so close, but we're not. We think of the things that our parents taught us. How long did it take us to admit that they were right? Bless you. Some of us still have it. Um, as an encouragement to a parent, we may not live to see it, but at some point, your kids will in their heart and in their mind say, you know what, mom and daddy was right. My prayer for that is that they will understand that mom and daddy were telling them what God wanted them to know. Because then they understand that's not mom and daddy. I wasn't rejecting mom and daddy, I was rejecting God. Then somebody gets a spiritual understanding and they can grow closer to God. Um, but I said all that to say this, so... Here, um, Nahum is prophesying against Nineveh. And I'll just go ahead and give you a spoiler here. Exactly what he said was going to happen about three years later happened. And God did an amazing thing, which God usually does. When there's evil standing against the world, or standing against him in the world, a lot of times God uses other evil to take out the first. And God allows this to happen until God finally deals with the last one. And, you know, we know if, um, if we remember, as Brother Richie has taught, uh, the book of, or the book, excuse me, the city of Babylon is named repeatedly throughout uh, Revelation. Um, and it's talking, you know, of, of a spiritual Babylon that this world will go into. We know that it's ultimately defeated with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and we know that it's, it, it will exist no more. Well, right here, the Assyrian Empire, guess what? About three years after uh, uh, Nahum wrote this, Babylon are the ones that conquered the Assyrians. So here we have a group that hated God. He hated his people. And God allowed them to basically fight amongst themselves. As we look around this world today, <clears throat> excuse me, I would dare say God's not concerned with the things that are going on. As far as our government, as far as society in general, because it's already been written. It's already been written. The end of it's going to come. And, you know, you see, I actually saw something the other day that was pretty interesting. There was a pro-Palestinian rally going on on a college campus. And there were hundreds and hundreds of people holding up Palestinian flags and shouting, death to Israel, death to the Jews. They were just demanding that Palestine be given free reign to do whatever they wanted to do. And all of a sudden, in the middle of this rally, you saw a pride flag fly up in the air. That ended exactly how you think it would. You saw the flag come down immediately. You saw it being ripped to shreds. And you saw the person that had held up the flag take off running in fear and terror. The sin of this world that is against God will eat itself. God already has declared it. We have the ending of the book. So I say that to say this. There's one verse that is going to be key to us Christians today because we're not looking at this as a history lesson. We're in the Old Testament. We're in a minor prophet, one that probably many of you, if I asked you to raise your hand, several could say you've never even read the book. Um, I just happened to think, somebody told me one time, said, you know, you think of Nahum, what are you going to do in eternity when Nahum walks up and says, hey, I'm Nahum, how are you doing? Did you read my book? <laughs> what, what, are we going to, what are we going to say then? You know, there's going to be several writers of these books that are going to be like, did you read my book? You ain't going to be able to lie to them, you know. So it's best that we read them and we understand exactly what they're trying to tell us because God has saved it. He's preserved it for us this day. So instead of looking at a history lesson that we could read on Wikipedia about Israel and Assyria and Babylon, what does this say to the 2023 Christian today? Um, one particular verse I want us to look at, we're going to go through chapter 1, but in um, verses 6 and 7, these are the ones that we really need to focus on as, as far as our um, encouragement and comfort today. In verse 6 of chapter 1 of Nahum, it says, Who can stand before his indignation? And who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. Verse 7, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we're going to look at today um, an aspect of you that a lot of Christians, we don't... Um, really talk about or preach about, Lord, and that is uh, exactly how terrifying your wrath can be. But God, in that, I hope that at the end of it, as you've laid on my heart, we see that that's a blessing to your people, to those, that, as this verse just says, those that trust in you. And Father, you know who trusts in you and who doesn't. And Father, I pray that we would have a more complete view of you today, one that will be encouraging to us. And Father, most of all, what you called us to do, you called us to live as obedient Christians, but in the Great Commission, you called us to go out and to tell others about the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we talked about Wednesday, as we see sin growing more and more rampant, well, open, we pray that that would spur us to speak to those that are obviously in need of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we wouldn't make any assumptions about anyone's spiritual condition. Father, let the Holy Spirit be the one that tells us when to speak and when not to, and not our, our own selves and our own feelings. So just pray now, Father, again, you would empty me of myself. You would forgive me for anything that you would hold all against me, Father, and just speak to your people through your word to set me aside, Father, and do your will. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> um, we're going to look at these things here of wrath and anger and fury. 
these are things, again, that we don't really see or like to talk about with, uh, about God. Because, well, why? Because we're Christians. And as Christians, we know that we are avoiding God's wrath. We are avoiding God's fury. We know at some point it will be released and unleashed here on this earth. But, you know, because of the, um, I'll start saying tribulation, sorry, the, uh, the rapture, uh, the Christians, the modern Christian, or the, the Christians, excuse me, will not be there. Those that have died looking forward to the Lord Jesus Christ and those that have trusted in what he did, will, we will not be here to suffer through it. Um, so why is it that we look here at God's anger and fury and things? Because this word indignation, let me, let me be clear on this. You know, if someone has some indignation, it's not indigestion, it's almost the same kind of an idea, indignation, that means they're standing and looking at something and almost in a way, I don't want to say looking down on it, but looking at it as less than. That's how we would look at it today. You know, someone said something and uh, they were very indignant at that comment, you know, just kind of a... Again, looking down on the nose, kind of an egocentric kind of a thing. What this word actually means in the Hebrew is a fury and an anger. So, um, this burning, well, it's an anger, this burning with such a fury that it's almost like someone frothing at the mouth. Someone that is that, <coughs> you ever been so mad and so angry you couldn't even speak? You just, didn't even, you, you just didn't even know what words to come out of your mouth. And this is kind of the idea, but because this is God, we know that it, it, it's the way he looks at sin. It's the way that God looks at sin in this world. And even more so, the way God looks at sin in the life of those that he saved. You know, what, what more betrayal can someone have than someone that turns against the person that has gone out of their way to help and to save and to do all these different things? I, I remember, you know, hearing several times on the news about someone that just in their kindness, they wanted to help someone and, you know, they go or invite someone into their home and end up getting killed because the kindness of their heart, they tried to help somebody. But yet, you know, uh, I think Miss Karen and I were talking about the other night. I remember hearing the story about a lady in Chicago. It was a young lady. I think she was in her early 20s. And she felt called of God to go and witness and to minister in these inner city slums. And the people in Chicago were like, no, I wouldn't go in there with an army. The police don't go into this area. But this lady felt very sure and very confident that God was calling her to go in to minister in this area. And she ended up losing her life. She was killed. And what does everyone say standing around? See, told you, she shouldn't have gone in there. That was dumb. That was crazy. That lady... And again, I don't know her heart. I've not read her story from her own lips. But if she went there and lost her life for the glory of God, she's a whole lot better off than the people talking about her. Victory to the world looks different than what victory looks like to God. Because I seem to remember a man that was beaten and killed and was mocked and spit on as he was dying. And the world looked at it like we finally got rid of him. And I'm standing here preaching about him today. Don't look at what the world looks like as victory, as success. Get that from God. But I want us to start looking in, chapter, in verse 2, excuse me. It says here, God is jealous and the Lord revengeth. The Lord revengeth. And it's furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserveth wrath for his enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are as the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. 
The mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation, and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire, and the rocks are thrown down by him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning, fl excuse me, overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. So as I was studying this, um, the picture I get is um, how many of you, and you don't have to raise your hands, you just know in your own heart, um, how many of you have ever bullied somebody? You know, there's been somebody a little weaker than you, a little less than you, or something like that, you know, and you've just decided to really throw your weight around, you know, really bully them a little bit. And then I ask the same question, how many of you have ever been bullied? Well, I imagine you're the bully, and you're picking on this little kid, and then all of a sudden you find out this bully has got an older brother, or excuse me, this young person's got an older brother. And the older brother's about 6'2", weighs about 280, plays football, is a wrestler, and all these different things. Um, now, how do you feel, you know, about that older brother? There's probably a little bit of fear in there, isn't it? Well, let me ask you this. What if you're the one being bullied, and at home you've got an older brother that's 6'2", about 280, wrestler and football player, and all it takes is you saying, hey, man, these, these guys are giving me a hard time. Nothing's changed about that older brother except for which side of the fence you're standing on. That brother is just as fearful to them as he is loving to you. To them, he's a source of terror. To you, he's a source of comfort. Now, that is a very poor example of the way to look at God, but it's one I think is an example we can all get our minds around. As fearful as they are of that brother, you know that that power is on your side is on your side. Now let's make it even more of a godly example. Imagine what that brother wanted to do was to show the bully the error of his ways and adopt him into your family. That's the God that we have. God doesn't want these people punished and dying and go to hell. God wants them to come to a knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So here, as we're talking about this city, Nineveh, the ones being proclaimed against, the Christian needs to look at it as God proclaiming this on the world. What does God say is going to happen to this world? It's going to burn up. Everything in creation has been polluted. The Lord Jesus, God, the Bible teaches that, that God put creation in his hand. By his hand was everything made. Nothing was made without him. And so, what do we have? We have righteousness through him. So, even though these physical bodies will burn up and go away, not the righteousness that God has graciously given to us through our acceptance of the sacrifice that was paid by the Lord Jesus Christ. So, what do we do with that? You know, we understand that everything is going to be destroyed. Um, there's going to be a new heaven, there's going to be a new earth. Somebody say, well, why would there have to be a new heaven? You know, well, go read uh, Job. Satan entered into heaven, and, and the Bible teaches us that he three times a day, or excuse me, twice a day, uh, accuses us of things. Morning and night, he accuses us. He's even polluted that. So whenever he's defeated for the final time, to suffer for eternity, not to be destroyed, but to suffer for all eternity, there's a new one that's never been touched by sin, that's never been touched by rebellion, that's never been touched by hatred, that's never been touched by jealousy, all these different things, and that's where we're going to get to spend eternity. But it's not about the place. It's about the person. It's about the person. Eternity heaven is simply the idea of Christ reigning supreme. We know that even here on this earth, the Bible teaches that the Lord Jesus Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years. We'll rule and reign with him. 
people will still need to get saved during that time, but over that thousand years, people will be born. And guess what? When Satan is loosed for a short time, just like that, people go right after him and follow him. Can't blame the devil. Can't say the devil made me do it. People have this heart of wickedness. They want to rebel. They want to rebel. They want to go against what's right. It's something that's in every single person. You know, and even sometimes God can use that. God can even use that. Because how many countries, excuse me, let me change this. How many uh, people that live in these countries where the Bible is illegal? Gathering together in order to meet and to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of these places where the government or the powers that be simply say, no, this will not stand? But yet God uses that little bit of rebellion in a man's heart to say, wait a minute, if they're telling me I'm not supposed to do this, I'm going to go check it out and see what it is. And then the Holy Spirit ends up lead, you know, leading them and teaching them the truth that they're a sinner and they're in need of the Lord Jesus Christ. God even uses our wickedness for his purpose. Time and time again. But I wanted to read this to you as I was studying it. I, I, I pretty much couldn't put it any better than <clears throat> excuse me, what this one commentator said. When he's speaking of God, he says, He resents the affronts and indignities done him by those that deny his being or any of his perfections. Now, I want you to let this sink in. We think like this. We think either you believe in God or you're an atheist. Okay? That, that's what we tend to believe. Here's the thing. You know, atheists don't even believe in pagan gods, except for themselves. But we want to look at it. Either you believe in God, if you don't. If somebody says, yes, I believe in God, we almost are praising the Lord. We don't know what God they're talking about. It might not be the Jesus of the Bible. And based on what the Bible says and statistics, it's probably not. So we need to go a little bit further. We need to ask the harder questions. You know, God doesn't mind asking us hard questions in our own heart. How many times have we thought we were fine? And then God just touches that one little thing and goes, is that really though how you feel? And then we're, woe is me, I'm undone. Well, Ask the hard questions if God wants you to. So God, it says here, it says, God doesn't only uh, resent those that deny his being, but anybody that denies his perfection. Or, you know, if we deny God's perfection, we're denying God. If we continue on, that set up other gods in competition with him. Now, that doesn't mean that we're going to say we're going to be pagans and start worshiping Odin and Thor. Or it doesn't say we're going to start worshiping Zeus. Or it doesn't say we're going to start worshiping, you know, we're going to go on a cruise this summer. So we're going to start praying to Poseidon or Neptune now. It just depends on what country we decide. That's not what it's talking about. It's talking about what are you putting in your heart that's in competition to God. I, I, I go back and I quote that book that Pastor Bobby gave a while back about the Ten Commandments, you know. And we read in the Ten Commandments, it says, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. And we always look at it like this. It's like, okay, this is where God is. And God says, don't put any gods here more important in your life. That's not what he's saying. God says, when you come before me, don't bring any other gods with you. Don't put any gods before me. Well, guess what? If you've got another heart, excuse me, another God in your heart, whether it be your job, whether it be your family, whether it be your children, whether it be riches, whether it be status, whether it be likes, whatever these things are, if you're putting them in front of God in your heart, then you're bringing other gods before him. God says don't do it. That destroy his laws or arraign his proceedings. So here it says that it's a, he resents those that destroy his law. How do you destroy a law? Disobey it. Say that it doesn't apply to me. It doesn't apply to my life. That's the destruction of a law, you know. If, if you go out here today and it's like, yeah, I see all these white signs that say what the speed limit is, but I know how fast my car goes, and I know, uh, you know, we run our lives like we drive a car. It's like I know what I can handle. I know how fast my car can go. I know what it would take for me to wreck. So 
I can drive my car the way I want to, and as long as no one's looking, I'm going to be okay. We've destroyed the speed limit. Speed limit is a law. We live our lives that exact same way. And not only that, it says that arraign his proceedings. What does that mean? If, if you ever, you know, when I hear the word arraign or arraignment, I think of like a court thing. And it's the idea of if someone has an arraignment, most of the time they go before a judge, they are, the judge is presented with the things that are brought against the person, and then the judge decides, okay, well, that person needs to stay in county, or that person, you know, can be released on bail, and all these different things. What God is saying is that our sin is being brought before him, and what we're doing is we're running the courtroom. God says it's a broken law, and we decide in our minds what the punishment's supposed to be. We decide whether we can go ahead and run along free or if we need to, you know, say a little prayer or tell God I'm sorry this time and then plan on the next time we're going to do it again. It says that he resents those that arraign his proceedings. God is the one that does that. You know, that was, that was what happened there in the Garden of Eden. You know, it was God said not to read of the book, or excuse me, not read, sorry, not to eat of the tree um, of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, okay? And it was not because the fruit wasn't good, but what it was, it was that God knew that the minute man did that, then man would be the one deciding what is good and what is evil. And that's what we're doing today. So, Next, he resents those that ridicule his word or are abusive to his people. Let such know that Jehovah, the one only living and true God, is a jealous God and a revenger. He is jealous for the comfort of his worshipers, jealous for his land, and will not have that injured. Now, I think that's pretty encouraging. So how do we look at the Bible when it talks about, you know, if I talk about these things of indignation or fury or anger, one of the worst things and one of the biggest disservices we can do to God is we try to take human emotions and the way we act or the way we would react and apply that to God. Um, when here when we talk about, <clears throat> excuse me, well, first of all, I want us to look, if you would, and if you don't want to turn there, you can just uh, mark these down. But in the book of Joel, um, chapter 2 and verse 18, the Bible says, Then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. Now, we don't like to be pitied. We don't like to be pitied. We don't like to be um, in obedience to anyone else. You know, we're taught our entire lives to be self-sufficient. Um you know, have we done a disservice to our children by teaching them to rely on themselves much more than we teach them to rely on God? Because if we do that, a lot of times what they end up doing is they create a version of themselves that is self-sufficient. Whereas it needs to be God of telling them where they're sufficient and where they need him. And just spoiler alert, we need him in everything. Um, but as we look here and continue on looking at, um, well, there where it talks about God being jealous, it, it's, it's a jealousy for his people. He wants them to have the best. He doesn't want the world to rob his people of what he's provided them. Think of yourself as a parent or a grandparent if you send your child or your grandchild to school with a lunch you've made them and then you find out for the last week someone in class has been stealing their lunch from them. How would you feel? Well, we would feel a certain way. But then what if you found out you were spending all that time and your kid was just going to school and just giving it away because they didn't care about the time that you had spent blessing them with the things that you loved them and gave them. Well, now look at how God feels. 
one way whenever the world is robbing us of the joy and the peace that we have through serving the Lord Jesus Christ. And then another time when we're like, yeah, it don't mean anything to me. Yeah, I know what Jesus did, but it doesn't mean anything. I'll just, I'll just give it away. I'll let the world rob that from me because I'll openly go and seek those things that will be God's in my heart. <clears throat> if we look at God's fury, if I were to say someone was furious, you pretty much, you know, you know people's personalities and everything. You know, if, if I were to tell you guys, and I, 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 I don't know why I always pick on strong family, I guess just because it's easy to do, but I'll just say, if I told you Holly was so mad she was furious, what would y'all go to in your mind? I mean, I know Lindsay's seen it, but I mean, we don't, we've never seen Holly be furious. But it's a level that we were like, ooh, ooh, that's, that's almost scary. You know, but God's fury is different. The Bible tells us here he's furious, but if you turn to Isaiah chapter 27 and verse 4, the Lord says here, he says, fury is not in me. Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I would burn, I would burn them together. So here we have God saying, um, fury is not in him, yet this other scripture says that he's furious. Well, that's God showing us the difference between our fury and God's fury. And it goes along the same with his anger. Before we give that explanation, let's look at one more verse where we talk about God's anger. And uh, that would be in Psalm chapter 78 and verse 50. He says here, he says, He made a way, talking about God, He made a way to His anger. He spared not their soul from death, but gave their life over to the pestilence. And he's talking here about how um, God was angry at Egypt and what they did to the Israelite people. But it's not our anger. Just as we've talked before about how God, the Bible tells us that God can choose not to remember something. And just a few weeks ago, you know, I gave the example. If I tell everyone right now, don't think about an elephant. That's the first thing that everyone goes, their mind goes to because you can't help, you can't control those things. God can. We don't understand that. If God chose not to think of an elephant, God would never think of an elephant again. He doesn't forget it. He chooses not to remember it. Let me explain that to you. I can. Holy Spirit can. But here, we talk about anger and fury. What are two things that usually happen when someone is furious or very angry? What's one of the first things they lose? Temper, and then what happens after that? What's well, something we should always have, but we lose it whenever we get angry and furious? We, we lose control. We lose control. God can be furious, and he can be angry, but he's always in control. He's always in control. Because, you know, have you ever been really angry and really furious and then you're able to pick and choose who sees that? You ever been in your home with several people? Maybe two or three people in your house never did anything. Everything's fine. All of a sudden, you get that fury and that anger in you and then you're mad at everybody. You're yelling at everybody. Remember what that first, first, first verse we read said? He said, God knows those that trust him. We are protected from that. Now, we may have God's chastisement. We may have God's chastisement. That's different than God's fury and God's anger. That's reserved for the enemies of God. Who are the enemies of God? Those that have not come to know Christ. And that's another thing we can't understand. An enemy of God, but yet God wants them to be his friend. Not only a friend, but a joint heir, to be adopted into the family. How many of your enemies do you think you would be willing, if, if someone told you, they'll no longer be your enemy, all you got to do is adopt them into your family. 
Let them come live with you. Let them be one of your dependents. How many of us be willing to do that? If we're not willing to do that or can't comprehend that, then stop trying to comprehend God and simply take him at what his word is. Because when we try to understand God, we do what that man said in the, uh, in the little thing that I read you earlier. We start taking away from God's perfection. From God's perfection. Every emotion that we have, everything that we go through, we go through it because we're made in the image of God, but yet the things that we lose control over, God's in perfect control of them. The Bible tells us that Jesus experienced all the things, you know, all the different emotions and the temptations that we have, but yet what? He was fully God and he was perfect. He never gave in to them. We can't understand and comprehend that. So if you can't understand and comprehend that, stop trying to comprehend God before you believe him. Simply trust him. And the last one, vengeance. Man, we are not supposed to be vengeful, are we? That is not anything that we are supposed to do. Um, that doesn't mean that it's not something that should that exi doesn't exist or that <clears throat> it's not, and I don't want to say useful, but it is one of the, it's the thing that's God's prerogative. Because it's not about what's done to me. If something is done to me, then I would say I need to get vengeance for what was done to me. If something were done to my family, I may have the feeling I need to require vengeance because something was done to what's mine. That shows my sinful heart because I'm the owner of nothing. I'm the owner of nothing. I wouldn't even have a family if God didn't allow me to have that. I wouldn't have the relationship to have somebody come up and do something offensive to me to where the point where I would feel I would need to get vengeance against someone. Because there's nothing that anyone can take from me that I don't have only because of the goodness of God. They take it from me. And if I get vengeance, what am I doing? I'm doing what that man said. I'm arraigning God's proceedings. I'm deciding what needs to be done. I didn't create me. I didn't create the thing. I didn't create the person. So therefore, I have no right to determine what needs to be done to any of the three. If we look in Deuteronomy, and this will be the last verses that we turn to look at, um, in chapter 32 and verse um, 40 and 41, the Bible says, For I lift up my hand to heaven and say, I live forever. Now, which of us can do that? None. So it's not talking about us. Verse 41, If I whip my glittering sword and my hand take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and reward them that hate me. Now, this is what Jesus told us, and we won't look there, but Jesus said that we were going to be hated. Why? Why were we, as Christians, going to be hated? Because they first hated him. They first hated him. So if someone hates you because of your testimony, of your service to Christ, understand that's nothing against you. It's not a personal hatred against you. If anything, we should be rejoicing and praying, uh, praising God that they hate Jesus so much and they see him in us. We look at that as a bad thing. But yet when the world sees Jesus and hates you because of it, it'd be enough to fall down and tell God I'm unworthy. Now as we continue on, and um, we may, I, I, I didn't share this earlier, I had about three or four different things that we were going to look at tonight, um, possibilities, and waiting for the Lord to, uh, to finish them. Uh, we, we may be back in this book tonight. We may not. But I did want to share, uh, to finish up with this, I wanted to see what God said. <clears throat> when we, we talked about the brother, the older brother that was, uh, you know, uh, however big I said he was, like 6'2", 6 6'4", 2, 6 280, whatever, you know, we know what that brother's capable of. Let's look at what God's capable of. In verse, um, the last part of verse 3, 
Um, it says, The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry, and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languishes, and Carmel, and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. Now, let's just stop right there. You know, I thought about this. I taught last Sunday morning in Sunday school, and then I ended up preaching for Pastor Bobby Wednesday night. And I shared something with you guys about my fear. You know, and I said that my greatest fear, for whatever reason, was tornadoes. They absolutely terrified me. And, you know, I thought about that because I spoke of it within just a few days. I'm like, Lord, why do I have that? That fear. Why do I not have the, the confidence in just trusting in you in these things? And then I read this scripture when I was studying this, and I realized I mean, we, we've seen things like hurricanes and tornadoes. We've seen things like snowstorms, ice storms that maybe would cause people to lose power, um, cause icy roads, things that are dangerous. We've seen shipwrecks. We've seen you know, probably everyone at some point has seen a dramatization or a, an idea of what happened with the Titanic sank, probably the most famous shipwreck ever. You know, and to me, the most terrifying thing was after the ship went down, I saw a movie, and it just showed this vast, vast, literal ocean with absolutely nowhere to go. And just the vastness of the ocean and how small people were that were either freezing to death or drowning in it. And I was like, it kind of hit me when I saw this. God doesn't allow these things to happen for us to be fearful of them. God wants us to see, you see that thing you're terrified of? With a thought, I can stop it. When you see something powerful that causes you fear, Nothing should be more encouraging than to know that you serve a God that can control that. The fear I have of a tornado, knowing that God could just brush it off. Have you ever seen storm clouds and been fearful of them? The Bible says here they're like the dust on his feet. They're, they're that small to him, but they serve his purpose. When it says there, it says, Bashan languisheth in Carmel, and the flower of Le Lebanon languisheth. That word languisheth means to droop or to be um, wilted. But it's important, the reason he listed these, Bashan was an area that was very fruitful. The word means fruitful. It's the idea, and uh, we've talked before years ago about the cows that grew there. They were like these huge cows with like extremely long, sometimes six, eight foot spans of horns on them, you know, this kind of an idea. And it said Bashan languisheth. <clears throat> Carmel. Um, you know, we've heard of Mount Carmel. <clears throat> well, the idea here, and I, I, let me get my, my definition because I had it here. Yeah, that one meant um, uh, like plentiful. And then last one, uh, let the flower of Lebanon, the word Lebanon means whiteness or something that's pristine and pure and clear. And the idea that if God's will were to be so, those things would be less than anything. They would be drooping. They would be wilting. They would be falling apart. <clears throat> and we keep going. It says the mountains quake at him, and the hills melt, and the earth is burned at his presence. You know, we talked Wednesday night about um, when um, Solomon was talking about, you know, the, the smallness of our lives. And the idea there, Solomon said that we could go to the top of Mount Everest, something majestic. We could go to a, a, a sequoia tree out in California, a redwood tree, or, you know, to some ocean, like go to the beach and stand on the ocean. And you stand there and you tell the mountain or that majestic tree or that huge ocean who you are, how important you are, and all the things that you've accomplished. And that thing would look at you if it could speak and say, you are nothing because I was here for eons before you and I will be here long after you. So you have that in your mind and the Bible says here that God can melt the hills. He can destroy the mountains like that. Jesus said the faith of a mustard seed could move a mountain. Guess what? That's not you doing it. That's faith in him. 
and him to lead us. I mean, that just sounds like, you know, as the world, if, if we were to tell the world, if, if God wanted to, he could move Mount Everest and throw it into the sea, and you would be laughed to ridicule until he did it. And then once he did it, they'd make an excuse. Stop arguing with the world. God's doing that. Trust Christ. <clears throat> and then we see there um, in, we continue on, excuse me. <coughs> excuse me. Um, it says in verse 6, and we talked about this one, who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. Um the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of the place thereof, and darkness shall pursue his enemies. That darkness he's talking about there is the eternal darkness. The place that will be filled with wailing and gnashing of teeth. These are not for a people that God has determined, that person is my enemy, and therefore they will die and end up in this place that I created for Satan and his angels. That's not what this is. That's God saying, this, is, this person is my enemy because they're making me less than what I am. But when you accept Christ, Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You accept Christ and you accept God for who he is. That's when you see the love of God because we all know how wicked and unworthy we truly are. And if someone could go to a cross and die a horrible death to save me, knowing not only the things I did before, but unfortunately because I'm flesh and blood and uh, sometimes end up in a carnal mind state, even the things I'm going to do after, when I give away the, my lunch to those others because it's nothing, because it means nothing to me, because I don't care about the person that gave it to me. Even then, he loved me. And he didn't love me because I loved him. He loved me first. Even in all that. When we see that, then we can start getting a glimpse of who God is. And I want us to continue on then in verse, um, uh, let's see, I'm sorry. Yeah, in verse 9, it says, What do ye imagine against the Lord? He will make an utter end. Affliction shall not rise up the second time. For while they be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. There, what, there is one come out of thee that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Although I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now I will break his yoke from off thee, and will burst thy bonds in sunder. I want to stop there, and I think this is where we're going to stop for today. We may continue this tonight. It depends on how the Lord leads. But this right here ought to be our encouragement. As we look around today, as the Bible says there, what can you imagine to stand against God? Because no matter what you can imagine, it, it, it's not. God says what will happen. He says, you know, those things will be folded together as thorns, and while they are drunken as drunkards, they shall be devoured as stubble fully dry. They'll be burnt up. They won't last. They will not stand. But he warns us. He says, there is one come out of thee, talking about the city of Nineveh, that imagineth evil against the Lord, a wicked counselor. This is the beginning here of sin. And again, as we're talking about the king and I'm drawing a blank on his name, of Assyria that stayed in Nineveh, that's a historical reference. But God is talking about one that has come out of the world and is a wicked counselor. Now, we could kind of be worried about that. You know what he talks about there? He, he says a counselor. What's a counselor do? Counsels. It's the one that when you have something, you go to them and you say, well, I don't know. 
I don't know what I should do. What should I do here? And a lot of times we're doing that, and when we cup our ear to listen, we're listening to the Lord. I mean, excuse me, the world. Sorry. We're listening to the world. Who's running the system now? Who holds the deeds to this earth right now? Satan does. And I've said this a thousand times. We talk about the Bible says our enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. I really believe the devil is listed last because the world gives us counsel and our flesh wants to listen to it. The devil doesn't even have to get involved. He doesn't even have to get involved. We hear something good because, you know, the world kind of loud and it's getting louder all the time. How does God speak to us? The Bible says in a still, small voice. You've got to be listening for that voice to get counsel from it. Not just, oh, that's what I heard loudest, so let me follow after that. But what does the Bible say here? And again, this ought to be encouraging. Thus saith the Lord, though they be quiet, and likewise many, yet thus shall they be cut down when he shall pass through. Though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. There is a day coming, there is a day coming that this wicked counsel will be in the midst of the people and has afflicted them and will not afflict them anymore. Now you may say, okay, well that's great. We know that Satan will be defeated. That's good. That's whenever in the future. No, folks, if you've trusted Christ as Savior, that day is today. He afflicts you as much as you allow him to afflict you. Satan is not stronger than the Lord Jesus Christ, who has saved you, delivered you from sin. That's not a future thing. That's right now. That's right now. Why was Paul the Christian that Paul was? Because Paul was listening for that still small voice instead of listening to the clanging of the world. He will afflict you. Are you going to sin? Yeah. We're going to. It should never be a lifestyle of a Christian. But we need to understand that it doesn't take away our salvation. And God has given a way for us to get that right immediately through repentance and prayer. Okay? There is no reason any sin in your life should be an affliction. The only reason it's an affliction is because you're holding on to it. It's like someone suffering from cancer and they go to the doctor and the doctor says, I can remove the cancer and they're holding on to the tumor saying, I don't want to get rid of it. I don't want to get rid of it. That's what sin is in the life of a Christian. When you're right there and it can be cured just like that. That's what he's saying when he says here, he says, I will, uh, though I have afflicted thee, I will afflict thee no more. For now, now, not later, not someday, I will break his yoke off from thee and will burst thy bonds in sunder. And the Lord hath given a commandment concerning thee that no more of thy name be sown. The words that you speak ought to be proclaimed in the Lord Jesus Christ. There shouldn't be a topic, a discussion, anything like that that's coming out of your mouth that's sowing the seeds of the world. The seeds of the world are like these kudzu plants out here. They're like the weeds. You don't have to sow them. They're going to run rampant on their own. But what are we doing? We end up through our conversation, through different things like that. We're sowing the seeds of sin and wickedness a lot of times without even realizing it. So what should we be sowing with our words? Lord Jesus. <clears throat> It says, out of the house of thy gods will I cut the graven engine, in image and the molten in, uh, excuse me, the molten image. I will make thy grave, for thou art vile. Thou art vile. Here is God speaking against a people that are in a wicked city that's turned their back on him. They knew him. They turned their back on him. But we know that here in the New Testament, in the, in the New Testament church that we live in, as we said a thousand times, sorry, here I am, lying preacher, exaggerating. 
as I've said, as I've said dozens of times, God's not willing that any should perish. God is not sending us out in our chariots, in our battles, to fight against this world. Just like vengeance, just like anger, just like fury, these are God's prerogatives. Now, God tells us in the word that we can be angry, but yet sin not. And, you know, I, I think it's interesting. I've talked about this before. You know, with G Jesus wasn't alone when he overturned the money changers' tables and ran them out of the temple with cat and nine tails. He wasn't alone. But why is it that all the disciples didn't see him just take off and start tearing stuff up and then they did the same thing? Because that was his house. It was meant to be a house of prayer. And he knew what he was doing. It was his prerogative for vengeance. It was his prerogative to be <clears throat> angry, but yet even in that anger, he could sin not. Just because we see an example of it doesn't mean that that's what we need to run out and do. We wait. Jesus gives the example, and if God calls us to do it, we have the example of how to do it. But just as we talked about in Sunday school a few weeks ago, when David, or last week rather, when David was confronted by the Philistines, he asked God, what do you want me to do? God said, go out and run them all. And he did. And then the second time when they did the exact same thing in the exact same place, David said, what do you want me to do? God said, I want you to go around behind them. Don't want to do anything. I'm going to fight them. In our lives, we may see the same thing over and over again every day. But we still need to have that relationship where we're asking God, God, what do you want me to do? But we see here, what does God look at? When you say something is vile, just think of that word vile. It's one of the, but to me, it's just, it, it brings in my mind the most disgusting of the disgusting. That's what God sees in this world, in this world system. That's what we see in this world, in this world system. But we need to understand that God is separating the people, the goats from the sheep, and the difference where we want to proclaim the goats and run them off to protect the sheep. God wants to turn them goats into sheep. God wants to bring them into the fold. We can't do it. We can't understand it. We don't know how to do it. But I hope what we can see this morning is that God can. It's God's will. So what is your part? Simple obedience. A relationship with God where God can say, I need you to speak here. Where God can say, no, 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 let them speak. Where God can say, I want you to go here. I want you to be kind to this person. I've got somebody else to talk to them. I need you to, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't confuse them. I'm handling that. You go over here. It's hard when God tells us to speak. But most of the time it's even harder when God tells us to sit down and shut up. Um, I hope that's been an encouragement to you today that we can see the difference in God's fury and anger and the idea of vengeance from what God says and what we see on it and that we can put our faith and trust in him. We've got greater than a big six foot four, 280 pound brother at home. We've got the one that created everything that's ever been created. And if you're a Christian this morning, he's on your side. Uh, the altar will be open. I'll ask Brother Randy to come and just sing as he feels led a couple verses of a song. Um, and after that, um, let's see, I'll ask uh, Brother Paul, if you don't mind, if you would dismiss us in a word of prayer. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. <coughs> Take your hand, books, please, and turn page. I'll say we know, softly and tenderly.
thanks, spend the time in your word that we know what is the truth. And Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.